Hi friends, today we'll be discussing transpiration in plants. It will be dealt in three parts. In this part, we'll be discussing structure of stomata, types of transpiration, guard cell wall structure in detail, and the significance of the transpiration. So first of all, let's understand what we mean by the what we mean by the transpiration. Transpiration, as you know, is a is a Latin is a Latin word. Trans means across. Spiry means spiry means to breathe. That means something is taken inside, across the membranes. We know through transpiration, water vapors are coming out, but at the same time, they help in the breathing of the uh, certain gaseous uh, exchanges take place in the plants. As soon as the plant is growing on the soil or in water, it has a root system, it has an aerial shoot system, it's connected with the soil through its roots, and there is a radial as well as the aerial conduction of the water. But ultimately, it lives in a situation where water is to be absorbed and water has to undergo the vaporization also. That vaporization through aerial parts is called as the transpiration. So transpiration is a loss of water vapors from exposed aerial parts of plant through their living tissue. Or we can also define it as the evaporation of water in the vapor form from exposed aerial parts of the plant. So you see, because of the transpiration, there is an approximately 98% of the absorbed water which is absorbed and it's through this transpiration it's returned to atmosphere in the form of water vapors. So transpiration is an evaporation. Transpiration and simple evaporation shows some resemblances as both are governed by similar physical laws and are also influenced by same sets of environmental factors. But of course, there is a difference between the evaporation and the transpiration. What are the differences between transpiration and evaporation? Transpiration differs from simple evaporation because transpiration is both physical and physiological process because it's controlled by environmental conditions as well as the physiology. That is, it involves absorption, osmotic pressure of the cells, thickness of the cuticle, number and characteristics of the stomata also. But evaporation is a physical process. It's controlled by environmental conditions like as relative humidity and the air currents. So transpiration is influenced by number of internal conditions of the plant because it has to cross the stomata, it has to, it has to, it's governed by the anatomy of the plant because evaporation occurs through free surface. Water in transpiration faces greater resistance by evaporating surface. Here it is on the free surface. Here we have an evaporating surface. That's a complex leaf having an anatomy and it has to cross the stomata, which are regulated pores. And also in case of evaporation, light does not directly influence the rate of evaporation. But in case of transpiration, light plays a direct role in transpiration because it helps in stomatal movement. Opening and the closing of the stomata depends upon the light because in sunlight and it during sunlight it can open and it can be closed during darkness so there is difference between the transpiration and the simple evaporation but in both the cases there is a loss of water vapors what is the magnitude of transpiration magnitude of water loss by transpiration is very high because we have seen 98% of the water is lost, absorbed water is lost. It varies greatly among plant species. There are some examples. Cotton plant may lose one liter of water per day. During its growing season, 
cotton plant it will be equivalent to 1 cm of rain per acre per day so it needs a huge amount of water in sunflower it is 2 kg per day in maize it is 3 to 4 liters per day in apple it is 36 to 45 liters per day that means magnitude varies in p in in beech it is 75 kilo kg per day in uh, birch it's 300 to 400 kg per day in elm it is 1 ton per day that means in in silver maple tree it's 58 gallons per day units may be different but there is a huge loss and it varies from species to species what happens to the remaining water so remaining water of about 2% in plants is used in various metabolic activities and growth of plants that means there is a loss of 98% of the water which is absorbed 98% of the water is lost by transpiration through transpiration it's only 0.2% is used in the process of photosynthesis because you know water is an important source of uh, uh, protons there and it it's uh, responsible for reduction of carbon dioxide to carbohydrates so only 0.2% is used in the process of photosynthesis rest is retained for hydration of protoplasm that's very important in the plant we can measure often transpiration is measured in terms of measured in terms of dried biomass produced by the plant the ratio between the amount of water transpired and the amount of biomass produced is called as transpirational ratio or it is also called as transpirational coefficient its value indicates the water requirement of the plant so that is how much is the transpiration and how much is the dry matter or the org organic matter produced by the plant so it will vary from plant to plant and it helps in devising an irrigation plans for such crops when you understand the transpirational ratio or transpirational coefficient it will make you understand how much water is required for the crop and you will devise an irrigation plan for that crop transpiration ratio varies in plants as per structural complexities of the aerial parts and their physiological requirements since we have different types of the plants it's minimum in camp plants crassulation acid metabolism plants succulents plants like pineapple you you know it has an stomata closed during day and open during night so it will be only 50 units while as its maximum in c4 plants or tropical grasses alpha alpha has 900 units it ranges in 300 to 500 per unit of dry matter for most mesophytes mesophytes are those plants which are terrestrial plants and that grow with an average supply of water sugar beet plants transpire 230 kg of water per kg of dry matter so this is as per the transpiration ratio you can determine what are the requirements and accordingly a person can devise the irrigation plans for that crop having seen the magnitude of the water loss let us understand the types of transpiration transpiration is broadly classified into two types foliar transpiration and kaolin transpiration foliar transpiration it includes loss of water vapors across leaf surface aerial part is the leaf and the leaf we we have understood the anatomy of the leaf there are present the stomata that is called as stomatal transpiration if transpiration occurs to the stomata it's called as stomatal transpiration and if it occurs to the cuticle it's called as the cuticular transpiration so accordingly we'll discuss first the stomatal transpiration stomatal transpiration it occurs mainly through stomata of leaves the stomata are tiny turgor operated valves they bring leaf interior 
in direct contact with atmosphere. They reduce the diffusion resistance for water vapors. And stomatal transpiration is the most important type of foliar transpiration. It accounts for about 90 to 97 percent of total transpiration and it occurs in two stages. There can be diffusion of water in leaf that is from moist cell wall of mesophyll cells, mesophyll cells into intracellular spaces. First, that is water will move from these mesophyll cells into this intracellular space. And second will be the passage of water vapors across stomatal aperture to outside. As we can see here, this is the, the section of the leaf, diagrammatic representation. This is the lower epidermis, intercept, interrupted by means of the gourd cells, kidney shaped gourd cells. This is the upper epidermis. These are the uh, mesophyll cells. Palisade parenchyma, these are the lower palisade par parenchyma or mesophyll cells and these are the spongy parenchyma cells and then this is the epidermis, these endodermis, the vascular bundle surrounded by means of endodermis, this is xylem and this is the phloem. This area below the guard cell is called the substromatal cavity and Across the leaf, there is present the air boundary layer or it can be also certain the cuticle, the epidermis will have a thick cuticle or the thin cuticle depending upon the species. So we have seen basically this substomatal cavity which is here, this is the leaf, there will be a leaf stomatal resistance. This will be the resistance here. And then there will be the boundary layer resistance that will be uh, taken by these guard cells. Whenever this leaf is exposed to the high irritants or the temperature, within this there will be if high vapor content is within the substomatal cavity and outside there is a low vapor content, that time the diffusion can take place and if the guard cells are open, there will be the transpiration and water in the substomatal cavity will be taken uh, from these mesophyll cells ultimately there will be water made available from the xylem so this is how water pathway through the leaf uh, is taking place uh, in 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 stomatal transpiration Second is called as the cuticular transpiration. Since leaf epidermis is surrounded by means of a waxy or the cutin layer, that's called as the cuticle, is a non-cellular layer composed of cutin and wax. It lies outside the epidermal cells of leaves and other aerial parts of the plants. The cuticle is mainly impermeable to water. If it is thin, it imbibes water from epidermal cells and gradually loses the same by evaporation throughout the day and night. Mesophytes and sheophytes. Mesophytes, as I have already mentioned, are growing in those areas which have in there the terrestrial plants that grow in an, within, within every supply of water. And sheophytes are those which are shade-loving plants. They experience high rates of cuticular transpiration in comparison to xerophytes. But cuticular transpiration constitutes 3 to 10 percent of the total transpiration. Next is Kalin transpiration. Kalin transpiration is a transpiration through young or mature sitem. It occurs in woody sitem, either through their permanent pores called lenticels, or through cracks of their bark that will be named as bark transpiration. First of all, let's understand the lenticular type of transpiration. It occurs on the surface of woody sitem and some fruits through their lenticels, small sorts of cracks are available there. Lenticels are biconvex small pores 
having loosely arranged complementary cells embedded in the periderm and are internally connected with xylem vessel. We'll see it in a diagram. So there are present, there are pores, small pores, biconvex small pores, which have complementary cells and they are embedded in the periderm. That's the bark of the cell, bark of the plant or the stem. Those small intracellular, through intracellular, small intracellular spaces present among the complementary cells, lenticellars connect the atmosphere air with water saturated cortical cells. How it is taking place? So it behaves as a main aerating structure in woody stems. Colleen transpiration, lentic lenticellars, lenticular transpiration especially. Lenticellars being unregulated pores lose water during day and night due to evaporation. Lenticular transpiration is nearly negligible. That's 0.1% of total transpiration. Maximum rate of lenticular transpiration in several plants have been estimated to be 1 milligram of water per centimeter square per hour. So it's very less a magnitude of water loss through choline or lenticular transpiration is very less. As you can see, this is a cherry plant where you will find these lenticellars. Lenticellars on wild cherry plant. These are the lenticellars. And here, these are the lenticellars also. And when you see the section of it, uh, mature lenticell, this is the mature lenticell. This area will be the periderm, phallum fel portion. This will be an phalloderm. And this will be the phallogen. The overall, it will be the periderm. That's the outer bark of the cell. The bark of the um, stem. And there will be presence of complementary cells. Of course, these complementary cells have the intracellular spaces. This is when it has burst to open. This area is called the lenticell. Now, there are present complementary cells which have intracellular spaces and they will be connected with the interior. That is the highly saturated corticated cells of the sitem. Uh, um, so, there will be an exchange. This is called as lenticular transpiration. Bark transpiration occurs through bark or the phalum. Phalum lies on the outside of the woody stems. Bark cells are dead and highly thick and superized. They are impermeable to water. They can lose water by slow process of imbibition. And this transpiration accounts to 0.5% of the total transpiration. So these were the types of the transpiration as per their structural, uh, the, the structure involved in a plant. What is the structure of the stomata? The basic thing is the structure of the stomata. As we know, stomata are minute pores present in the epidermis of leaves or in soft aerial parts of the plant. They are roughly elliptical in outline. Stoma are a pore is bounded by two specialized smaller epidermal cells known as guard cells. In dicot leaves, guard cells are kidney shaped and they are oriented randomly in the leaf epidermis. In monocots, they are dumbbell shaped and are oriented in the same direction in the leaf epidermis. As you will see, this is the kidney shaped one guard cell, this is the kidney shaped guard cell, these are the epidermal cells. And structurally, when you see, it is having a wall, cell wall, which will be differentially thickened towards the inner side, they are thick walled, towards the outside, they are thin walled. And then there is centrally located nucleus, there is present chloroplasts, and there is a presence of certain fibrils, which are microfibrils, uh, which are ra radial micellations uh, occurring towards the in the inner inner uh, thick uh, cell wall. So this is a kidney shaped guard cell having the opening here, which is called as a stoma or the pore. In case of monocots, the the cells guard cells are in the form of a dumbbell shape or two dumbbell shaped cells but they are also associated with subsidiary cells and 
each dumbbell has radial micellation on these uh, bulged portions they have uh, all cellular components as is in case of the kidney shaped gall uh, kidney shaped guard cells the subsidiary cells are also located there but they are oriented in the same direction of the epidermal cells guard cells are pairs of epidermal cells the guard cells are connected with adjacent cells through plasmodesmata so there are the connections between the epidermal cells and the guard cells that's maintained through plasmodesmata each guard cell is surrounded by a cell wall having differential thicknings wall facing the pore side or inner side are thick and rigid having radial micellation of cellulose on its tangential walls radial micellations allow more elongation than lateral expansion while as wall on the outside is thin and elastic differentially thickened cell wall plays a significant role in stomatal movement guard cell walls are strong and elastic yet elastic to withstand high turgor and allowing reversible stomatal movements you see during stomatal movement there is a massive change in the cell volume from closed to open when it is closed when when the guard cell opens it's there is an increase 25% increase in guard cell volume so there will be a lot of pressure how they sustain the pressure guard cells experience about 10 times greater pressure than other cells guard cell is able to undergo reversible changes multiple times a day that means they will open they will close they will return back to its original shape so guard cell wall is unique so we will be discussing something about the guard cell the the the, the ultra structure of the guard cell guard cell wall is strong yet flexible because these are tiny turgor operated valves they will undergo closing and opening guard cell wall is made up of cellulose hemicellulose pectin and structural proteins guard cell wall polysaccharide components are conserved across the species they are present almost in all the species and it has been seen pectin plays a role in cell wall flexibility pectin is a complex polymer composed of homo galacto galacto uron uranon hg and ramino galacto uranon rg1 rg2 and xylo galacto uranon xg and apio galacto uranon ag this is the pectin a polysaccharide having uh, this this pectin is a polymer composed of these hg h rg1 rg2 xg and ag in addition to this there are present side chains in rg1 they are arabinan let us see the structure of this this is the multiple forms of pectin and its side chains so we we have seen that there is present hg there is present rg1 rg2 xg and ag these are the structural details when we see the rg1 rg1 has a backbone and there are present the arabinan side chains which can be small or large these are the arabinan side chains this is rg2 xg and all this this is the chemical composition of multiple forms of pectin so we have a situation here arabinan exists in small and long chains on a backbone arabinan side chains prevents the two backbones to come together side chains but it has been seen exogenous treatment with arabinose in epidermal strips prevents stomatal movement because arabinose uh, degrades the arabinan as a result the two backbones are coming together removal of arabinan side chains allow two backbones to come together and there is a binding of calcium uh, between two backbones that locks them together as a result calcium cross linking induces wall stiffening 
the flexibility of the cell wall is greatly reduced and prevent stomatal movement that means if this is the backbone of arab uh, this uh, ag and these are uh, rg1 and these are its side chains arabinan so because of these the two chains are kept separated uh, when this is degraded arabinan side chain is degraded as a result they are coming together there is a calcium binding and the two will come together there will be the cross linking as a result there will be the stiffening and which will prevent the stomatal movement god cell wall polysaccharides have been identified <coughs> by imaging experiments polarized light microscopy for cellulose amino labeling coupled with fluorescence microscopy transmission electron microscopy in thin sections for hemicellulose and pectin these are the methods available by which we can see uh, what are the polysaccharides uh, in the form of cellulose hemicellulose or pectin present in the god cells this homogalactouranin hg is synthesized in the golgi complex and it is demethyl esterified and degraded in the apoplast then that's it is after certain processes when it is synthesized it is demethyl esterified and then is taken back into the apoplast that is in the cell wall depositions in golgi galactouranosyl transferase transfer galactouranic acid residues into existing alpha 14 linked uh this uh, galactouronic chain acid chain let us see by way of a diagram uh, first of all let's discuss uh, what's happening then we will concentrate on the diagram which amply explains this mechanism pectin methyl transferase pmts add methyl groups on to galactouronic galactouronic acid residues highly methyl esterified hg is then exocytosed to the apoplast with an apoplast it is demethyl esterified by pectin methyl esterase pectin methyl esterase and demethyl esterified hg can be cross linked by calcium it can be also degraded by polygalactouranase pgs and pectate lyases as a result there can be a block wise demethyl esterification or there will be a random demethyl esterification block wise demethyl esterification facilitates calcium cross linking it contributes to wall stiffening random demethyl esterification makes hg susceptible to degradation to these pg that is polygalactouranases and pectate lyases as a result there is a wall loosening so that means there is a proper mechanism which can be explained if this is the cell wall apoplast this is the cytosol there are the golgi complexes they are making these chains and there is a presence of these uh, galactouronic acid alpha 14 galactouronic chain and there can be additions of these galactouronic acids to it and then there will be uh, in presence of uh, there will be methylation to it in presence of pectin methyl transferases and these processed chains are taken inside the apoplast by a process of exocytosis where these chains can undergo no processes there can be one way that is if there is a demethyl esterification in a block wise manner that is here and here between the two chains there will be the calcium cross linking that time that means if there is a block wise deesterification demethyl esterification and the two chains will be 
showing the cross linking of the calcium and there will be a wall stiffening so wall stiffening will be especially between the 1,4 alpha linked galactouronic side chains two chains will be together but one situation can arise here there can be in presence of pectin methyl uh, esterases or pectin methyl methyl esterase inhibitors which antagonize the activity of these pectin methyl esterases as a result there will be removal of the uh, methyl methyl uh, esterification demethyl esterification which can occur randomly here here and here once there is a random demethyl esterification by means of these either the inhibitors or by means of pectin methyl transferases this will be susceptible to pgs and pls that is polygalactouranase or pectin lyases as a result hg will show degradation this chain will show degradation and there will be the pectin degradation as a result there will be the loosening that is called as the wall loosening so this is how as has been presented by uri in etel in 2018 the possible mechanism of uh, wall stiffening and wall loosening in case of the gourd cells in arabidopsis genes encoding pectin modifying and degrading enzymes exist in large families so there is a proper genetic mechanism cellulose microfibrils in intact gourd cells of arabidopsis undergoes changes in open stomata cellulose microfibrils exist even distribution this is one more study they have seen in case of an open stomata cellulose microfibrils exhibit even distribution and in closed they are in they are bundled so research is going on to understand molecular basis of gourd cell wall formation so that regulation of the stomata can be controlled and so that there is a less transpiration and the conservation of the water so pectin also should undergo remodeling being uncross linked in the open state and cross linked in the closed state this is in case of arabidopsis it has been seen that when the stomata is closed that time the cellulose become bundles and pectic uh, edg is cross linked with calcium so these red represents the cellulose and green represents the xylocaine and the pectin is in blue so we have here a cellulose are in bundles and also pectin are cross linked that means there is a closure stiffening but whenever it's opened that time cellulose diffusely distributed so you will see the red is diffusely distributed here and pectin edg are uncoupled so there is no cross linking that means when there is no cross linking that means it has it has opened no stiffness is there there is a loosening this is as has been seen in case of arabidopsis in addition to this cell wall gourd cell wall which has a complexity and which is allowing it an uh, flexibility or its movements there is also present a cuticle which is more permeable to water vapor sometimes gourd cells have numerous ectodesmata through which water can be uh, lost uh, permeable to various polar substances in gourd cells cuticle is thicker on the outer parts each gourd cell has cytoplasmic membrane in young and developing gourd cells pectin and cellulose are gradually deposited into plasmodesmata plasmodesmata is a thin layer of cytoplasm it disappears as gourd cells mature remember we said that gourd cell is connected with the adjacent epidermal cells through plasmodesmata so there is a formation of plasmodesmata in the gourd cells also but whenever it is mature it disappears in gourd cells but few are retained having perforations on their walls through which exchanges can take place this is the cuticle layer 
and then within the god cells lipid droplets are present which are intermediates in the synthesis of wax and cutin high amounts of endoplasmic reticulum is present there because it has a secretory role also number of small vacuoles filled with cell sap chloroplast with few less organized lamellae mitochondria in high amounts owing to high metabolic activities dictyosomes containing molecules like lipases endopeptases phosphatases and dnases ribosomes are present there nucleus is centrally located and other cellular organelles so you have seen structure of stomata in detail right from its cell wall cuticle and the internal cellular organelles now the size of the stomatal aperture because these two god cells makes a stomatal aperture it varies among plant species average size of stomata ranges between 6.7 to 17.7 microns it is 4 micrometer wide and 26 micro millimicrons millimicrons it is 4 millimicron wide and 26 millimicron long in corn 3 into 38 millimicron is avena species and that means stomatal aperture also varies and stomatal fre frequency there's a number of the stomata per unit area also shows great variations their number varies from 1000 to 60000 per centimeter square god cells are surrounded by modified epidermal cells especially in case of the monocots they are named as subsidiary cells or accessory cells they are also derived from same meristemoid which form the god cells and two god cells plus aperture plus subsidiary cells that is named as a stomatal apparatus when the stomata is present on the two sides of the leaf it's called as amphistomatic as is in case of the mulberry in amphistomatic leaves lower surface has more named as multistomatic or they can have uh, less stomata on the upper surface they are called as partially stomatic upper surface of leaf when there is only stomata on the upper surface of leaf they are called as epistomatic as in case of water lily lower surface of leaf only hypostomatic in apple there is a proper classification we will discuss it later on in xerophytes subsidiary cells form a sunken epistomal cavity epistomatal cavity god cells are pushed below the level of the surfaces so in case of xerophytes we find that epidermis is interrupted uh, epidermal cells uh, below the epidermal cells are present the god cells and then it is surrounded by means of the cuticle so there is an epistomatal cavity they are called as sunken stomata and this is the substomatal cavity this is basically an adopt mature water conservative mature in case of the xerophytes so stomata of the xerophytes is sunken we call it as a sunken stomata what is the role of stomata now stomata plays a significant role in transpiration it's understood about 90% of total transpiration occurs through stomata during water citrus condition stomata gets closed to prevent permanent wilting of plants stomata plays a role in water conservation during water stress conditions because that time stomata closes we will see it in the mechanism stomata provides low resistance pathway for gaseous exchange because it's very important that carbon dioxide is to be taken in and oxygen is to be evolved during photosynthesis and during respiration so during respiration we have to see there should be an intake of the carbon dioxide and the outflux of the oxygen so they also play direct indirect regulatory role in the passive absorption of the water as we have seen in case of the ascent of the sap there is a transpirational pull which is responsible for the ascent of the sap absorption of minerals also by regulating transpiration these are the roles of the stomata what is the significance of the transpiration now transpiration is a vital phenomena and is called as necessary evil in plants why it's called a necessary evil because 98% of the water is lost and only 2% is utilized by the plant several beneficial effects of the transpiration are 
it helps us in free gaseous exchange as we have already seen ascent of sap it has it creates a cooling effect around aerial parts of the plant does not allow the leaf temperature to rise to detrimental level it helps us in passive absorption of minerals as we have seen in water absorption because of transpiration plants are considered as green bridges between soil and atmosphere so it leads to the development of spac concept that is called as the soil plant air continuum it helps us in understanding the intimate relationship between soil plant and atmosphere a gradient of water potential exists in spac its minimum in the atmosphere minus 1000 bars and maximum in the soil minus 2 bars and intermediate in plants roughly minus 10 to minus 30 bars which is responsible for the responsible for the ascent of the sap also water moves from soil to atmosphere as per water potential gradient spac forms a biotic environment environmental water system and transpiration is an integral part of its playing a major role so transpirational water loss serves as a significant input for biological water cycle also because there is a loss of water their water is taken back so biological water cycle transpiration plays a very important role in that it helps in the development of extensive root system when there is more transpiration in the plant there will be an extensive root system sorghum has an extensive root system then less transpiring maize it improves quality of fruits and vegetative parts also what are the harmful effects of the or disadvantages of the transpiration first it leads to lower cycle wastage of water through plants 98% of absorbed water is lost due to transpiration it amounts to wastage of energy huge water deficit formed due to transpiration offer leads to wilting and injury to plants so that's why we call it as a necessary evil so in this tutorial we have seen what is the structure of the stomata how its guard cell wall is uh, responsive to the, the the stomatal movements and what are the what are the types of the transpiration what is the significance of the transpiration why we call transpiration as a necessary evil in next tutorial that will be part 2 and part 3 will be discussing the mechanism of transpiration the old concepts and the modern concepts and also will be discussing the factors affecting the transpiration till then i hope in this video tutorial we have understood we have uh, we have cleared some of the points uh, in next video uh, till then uh, thank you for the patient listening and be safe and be happy thank you very much